this is so cool to me and so fascinating to me, but you're a paranormal researcher. And one of these days I'm going on a hunt with you. I'm going to do, do the yes. thing with you. <laughs> yes. I would but love that. I would love that too, because I'm a little obsessed, but how, how did such a nice girl like you get into paranormal study? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> long, st not a long, well, uh, it is a long story, but I, I'll do the abridged version. Uh, so I was really into it when I was a kid. Um, I had experiences. Uh, my first experience when I was about seven or eight years old. And I've always been interested in like the weird stuff. Um, and uh, my mother was very much against it. I mean, we, I couldn't even read the Goosebumps series. Like that's how adamant she was. So, uh, but of course, when you tell a kid not to do something, what are they going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so I was literally reading the Goosebumps books um, in the library and just kind of putting in a little bookmark and putting it back on the shelf, you know, when I had to go home. Uh, and then I ran into other uh, paranormal books because uh, I ended up going to the county library at one point. And that's where I started really seeing like, okay, people are actually researching this. Um, and then I had a really terrifying experience when I was 17 that actually scared me out of it for a bit. Uh, so I went to college um, and I had some experiences at the theater on my campus. <laughs> and that's actually really where the whole, I think I might want to do this as more than just a passing, a passing uh, interest, but I think I might want to really research this because I want to know what's going on. So, and it's all history from there. So I think you're going to have to host for paranormal field trips because um, Natasha's in too. We're going, we're going, we're going ghost hunting with you. <laughs> so, um, you know, I've actually been thinking about it, like a little local uh, paranormal tour of the area. So <laughs> I love that. I yeah. love that. You, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, so what? exactly i mean now you're writing your own books what does a mm -hmm. paranormal researcher do exactly because when i think of anything paranormal the first thing mm -hmm. that comes to my head is ghostbusters but that's not what this yeah. is so <laughs> what does a paranormal well, I mean, researcher do <laughs> we don't have the pro we don't have the proton packs um it's a little different <laughs> We don't trap the ghosts in the boxes. Um, but what's interesting is Dan Aykroyd um, comes from a family of paranormal people. He's actually a, I want to say, third generation paranormal enthusiast. His father and his grandfather were very into the paranormal and parapsychology. Um, actually, in the opening scene where, you know, Bill Murray has the cards with the different symbols on it, um, it's called, they're called Zener cards and they're actual cards that are used to test out intuition. So it's actually a thing. <laughs> um, so that's, so that's actually a thing, but, um, yeah, so what I do, there's a paranormal researcher and then there's a ghost hunter. And for me, ghost hunters tend to, they go to the location, they do a lot of field work, um, which is totally, which is totally awesome. You know, I don't get a chance to get out on the field as much as I want to, Sometimes, especially if I'm in a show, because, hey, you know, when you're doing a show on a Friday and Saturday night, I'm going to bed afterwards, but because <laughs> uh, I need to be up for the matinee the next day. So um, so I don't get a chance to do as much field work as I want to, but um, but they go out there and they're out there. But par paranormal researchers, they're I don't want to call them like armchair critics because there are a lot of paranormal researchers that go out and do field work too. And I'm technically I'm one of them too, but they really dive into like the history, the lore. Um, and besides just having the experience, they want to know why the experience is happening. So like for me, if this old man is haunting this house, I'm going to be looking into, okay, let's look in the history of the house. Who's the old man? What's his name? Who's his family? <laughs> I want to find out as much as I can about him, and then I'm going to go in there and ask a lot of questions or test different theories and ideas to see if we can get a response. If there's a common reporting of, hey, um, all the glasses tip over every time at, at 2 a.m., 
okay, well, I'm going to be sitting in the kitchen at 2 a.m. to find out why those glasses are falling. And I could find out, well, maybe there's a heavy truck that drives by at that time and the glasses just go, <laughs> or there could be something else going on that's making the glasses tip over. So it's a lot of um, experimentation. It's a lot of uh, different uh, testing out different ideas, testing out different theories and see what happens. So, Okay. If I'm sitting in the house at 2 a.m. and glasses are falling off the shelf, I'm probably running out the door. But you're <laughs> not. You're, you're much more curious than I am. So yeah. um, I, I guess what are some of the <laughs> – my friend Jennifer is giving the thumbs up. She's running out the door with me. Um, <laughs> Right, Jennifer? Running out the door. Um, but <laughs> I guess, what are some of the myths? Because I I don't think, I think because of um, TV, because of movies, we're, we're thinking that these ghosts are here to hurt us or eat us or mm -hmm. kill us or do something terrible. I, I don't think that's probably the case. So what's some of the myths? Debunk some um, of the things for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think with paranormal TV, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about paranormal research and ghost hunting. Uh, one, you're not going to probably encounter a ghost at, like in your first ghost hunt. Uh, <laughs> in fact, you may be sitting in the dark for about eight hours and not a lot is happening. And maybe you'll hear one sound and be like, what was that? We do say, <laughs> what was that? A lot. What was that? <laughs> uh so ghost hunting is actually a very quiet and long experience. Um, now, I have been in locations where it was far from quiet, and we actually ended up calling off an investigation early because of it, because so much was happening. Uh, but that's a rarity. That doesn't happen too, too often. But, yeah, so ghost hunts aren't really quick, because on TV, what you're getting is the best, like, 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, when really the talent has been at that location for probably at least 24 hours. Uh, so that's a big one. Um, what, also another thing is ghosts aren't necessarily, they're not necessarily there to hurt you or scare you. Uh, what's often happening is if they see that you can see them or you can hear them, they're going to want to talk to you. Uh, most of the time, there are introverted ghosts, and I have stories about that. Uh, there are introverted ghosts that aren't interested in talking at all. It's actually, um, I, I relate like to those. <laughs> well, and that, and actually, that gets down to the heart of it. Ghosts are people, and the way you talk to ghosts is the same way you would talk to people. Um, I think that's one big thing that, that TV and myths tend to overlook is there's always these images of ghost hunters and like infrared cameras going, give us a sign of your presence or um, spirit. Why are you here? You know, very, <laughs> very dramatic and uh, very, um, out, very uh, distant. Um, so in my approach to ghost hunting is very much bringing the humanity and the empathy back into ghost hunting and basically just talking to them as people and, yeah. <laughs> so if you're sitting in a house, I know I'm veering off. I For all of you, I sent Alex questions, but now I'm thinking of a hundred more things to ask her. That's so awesome. I'm kind of veering off the script right now. But um, if you're sitting in the house, going back to the glasses, the glasses fall off the shelf. We know there's not a truck going by to make the glasses fall off the shelf. Then what? How do you communicate with the ghost how do you how you know how 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 do you open up the line of communication yeah well after we've verified that something weird made the glasses fall over we would probably start saying hey you know are you here to talk to us you know we'll just say we'll say hello um we'll usually introduce ourselves to and give them our name you know saying hey my name's alex and you know, I'm here to talk to you, and I just want to know your story. I don't mean any disrespect. Uh, we just want to know who you are and see if there's anything we can do for you. Uh, so, and usually we'll have some sort of other um, device with us. 
uh, like a K2 meter, um, which that's the classic little thing that has the lights that go back and forth. Um, it's actually meant to pick up electromagnetic fields. Um, there's a lot of research that that indicates that there is a relationship between ghosts and electromagnetic energy, um, whether that's the electromagnetic energy is making us hallucinate or uh, the electromagnetic energy, like, you know, our brains have electricity in them and there's electricity running through our bodies right now as we speak. So that's a whole other conversation for another time. But we'll usually have some sort of device with us that will indicate like some sort of interaction is going on, whether it's a K2 meter. There's also another another piece of equipment called a... Um, it's a ghost box. It's like a radio sweep. So it sweeps through all the radio stations. I tend to go on the AM station because there's not a lot of voices on it. Not as much as like a, an FM station where it's there's voices all the time. And I can't tell if, you know, old Billy Bob Joe is trying to talk to me or if it's Cardi B. So <laughs> I tend to go, I tend to go with AM stations. So we'll usually interact through like, some of those devices, I'll usually have a psychic medium with me too. I have one on my team and I'll just ask her, I'll be like, Hey, you know, what are you picking up right now? But we try to keep the focus on the ghosts, like talking to them, like, Hey, you know, and depending on the context of when they were alive, we may change our verbiage a little bit. You know, I'm not going to talk to a ghost from the civil war saying, Hey, what's up? <laughs> you know, how you doing, man? <laughs> I wouldn't say that to a ghost from, you know, the Civil War era. Right. Uh, I would be much more formal. And um, I would say, oh, you know, we would, uh, it would be, it would be a pleasure to sit down with you and have, if, if I'm in the South, have a chat, uh, you know, depending on where, who I'm talking to, where they're from. Yeah. So keeping up those formalities to as, as best as we know, uh, because we want to make it familiar with them. And we're already holding tech that, They've probably, depending on when they die, they've probably never seen before. So, um, yeah, we just talk and see what happens, and we just go with the flow. I try to not keep it too structured, because if a ghost wants to talk, but I'm supposed to go to the next room in 10 minutes, it's not going to work. Right. So, are you recording these um, events? Are you recording what's happening around you? Yeah, we usually have uh, recordings happening for audio, and we also do video. So, and we try to have as many videos, video cameras, because we have a surveillance, we have a surveillance equipment. We try to keep it on the hot spots, but also we'll carry camcorders with us. So if something happens, it gets really exciting if the audio recorder picks it up and one of the cameras. Um... I'm losing you, but I I, th I don't think I've actually lost you. I, ha I st st still see the video, but I was losing the um, audio, but hopefully we're good. Okay. Um, okay, now I can hear you. Um, okay. What happens to the data? So after it's done, you've communicated, you've gathered this data, then what? So we review it, uh, which can take quite a bit of time. Uh, so say if we have eight cameras and our investigation was four hours, that's 32 hours of footage to go through. Uh, if we have our audio recorders, that's, depending how many audio recorders, that's more footage. So it'll, it'll take some time to get through all the footage. Depending on the circumstance, now my team, we tend to investigate a lot of homes. So a lot of times we'll keep the data. We'll ask the client if they want to hear it or see it, uh, if they're comfortable. If they're not, if they're not, we just hang on to it. Um, if it's a public location, then usually we will try to get it out there somehow. Uh, just for asking for like peer review feedback, saying, "Hey, this is what we got. This is what happened at the time. You, you know, let us know what you think." Uh, and sometimes it turns into, oh, I think this was a car, or it could be, <laughs> oh, this is great. <laughs> so, because, uh, you know, we're always trying to learn and get some feedback. So, yeah. How big is your team? Aside from me, Currently, I'll I have be nine. an honorary team member as I run out the door. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. Uh, so right now I have nine people on the team. So it's actually the biggest the team has ever been in a while. <laughs> okay. 
then are they all, I mean, you said it's you, there's a psychic on your team or a, a mm -hmm. medium. Do, do other people have kind of assigned roles or are you all just kind of doing the same thing? Uh, we have assigned roles. Um, actually, I do have multiple people on the team that have abilities, but I tend to try to put a rein on that because otherwise it kind of turns into a mess if I have all of them going at the same time, especially when they start tainting each other and mm -hmm. giving each other like prompts and stuff where I'm like, eh. but I have a case manager and what she does is she will field the cases that we get because on our website, if you have a haunting and you want it investigated, we can, we can check it out. You just have to fill out a form. Um, my case manager is a social worker, so she does have a background in mental health, uh, which I think is important in this field. And then I do have a tech guy. I have a guy who understands tech way better than I do. <laughs> so uh, especially if something's not working or it could break, I just kind of look at him and go, help. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, can, can, you, can you look at this for me? Um, which has been a godsend. Uh, yeah, and the other members of my team, I mean, we all kind of contribute different things. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a website that we, um, that we have for, with like different articles and stuff, so they'll write stuff for the website. We also have a little paranormal podcast with our team. It's called Informal Paranormal. And literally it's just, it's like eavesdropping on a conversation between ghost hunters. Like, what do we talk about when we're on the road to a location? That's so cool. That's so, okay, yeah. so Informal Paranormal Podcast. And then what's the yep. website? Throw out the blog for the website. So be Yeah, uh, parastudync.com, uh, P-A-R-A-S-T-U-D-Y-N-C, like North Carolina.com. Okay. So now that we're all held up in our houses and we can't go anywhere, we're all sheltering in place. Um, yep. Let's talk about Broadway, the theaters, local haunts. Um, mm -hmm. So now the, let, let's talk about one thing that's getting thrown out a lot right now because the theaters are dark. And last week there was this social media post going around about a ghost light. And for people who aren't in the theater, they may not know what that is. So can you talk about the ghost light and where that kind of came from? Yeah, so the ghost light legend has always been, I've always been fascinated by it, mainly because it was called a ghost light. And I'm like, ooh, why is that a called a ghost light? I think that was like one of my first like big memories when I, when I started doing theater was, oh, ghost light. Is that, is that because there's ghosts in the theater? And <laughs> Of course, it's been a hot mess since then. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, you know, besides the ghost light being um, a thing to help you not fall and die and become a ghost uh, when you go into a dark theater, uh, it's, you know, there's legends. And, of course, you know, theater people are su really superstitious, especially about the Scottish play. Um, and I have a whole rant about that. Um, <laughs> actually have some theories about why that curse exists. And, uh, you know, it's, it's to keep the lights on for, um, for the ghosts that, you know, may haunt a theater or find themselves on the stage um, to help them navigate uh, around, like some say into the afterlife, some say just for the space itself. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to say almost since there's been electricity, the ghost light has been there in some kind of form. Um, and it's really just it's a light that sits in the middle, usually, of the stage. It's, and it's, the stage. it's on all the time. <laughs> yep, it's, it's on all the time. And, um, yeah, uh, and what's interesting is, um, you know, I, I totally believe in the ghost theory, too, uh, especially since the Palace Theater is one of the most haunted theaters on Broadway. Um, I've actually written about it quite a few times. Um, they actually have two seats designated in the house for their theater ghosts. Like, oh, gosh. oh wow. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I wrote an article about the most haunted theaters in, on Broadway and, or in, in America. I didn't just focus on Broadway. I, I did worldwide or America-wide. And uh, so, and there's a big, there's some really big superstitions of keeping the ghosts happy because if the ghosts aren't happy, then they start to wreak havoc. I mean, it's, it's. Totally like Phantom of the Opera plot, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so it's like keep. Oh, uh, what is what's that line in Phantom of the Opera? It's like keep box something open, like open for the, uh, ghost, I, the opera ghost. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. It's for the opera ghost. Like he fucked. Oh my gosh. Someone, I, I'm, I haven't listened to, it's going to make me sound really terrible. I haven't, I haven't listened to fan of the opera in like, it's okay. 10 years. <laughs> so, um, no, no, yeah, judgment. this is a judgment free zone. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. Uh, but going to the phantom of the opera. So this is really interesting, but it's, um, the Paris opera house. They, mm -hmm. that's where this all came from. There's a real life opera house in Paris and there yep. actually is a lake under it, which mm -hmm. I didn't know. You can't go there on the tour, but I've saw pictures on it when I was researching this and that's, yep. that's, so is that like one of the haunted theaters in the world? Um, I've actually, I've heard, I've heard some really interesting things about the Paris Opera House. I've, I've seen it. I haven't been inside it, but um, I saw it in 2007. Um, and one of my friends, I wasn't, this was back when I was trying to avoid the paranormal, but it kept finding me when I was studying abroad in England, um, especially when I was living in Oxford. That place is super haunted, just to let you all know. <laughs> so um, I, I, I kept, I kept, there when i was in oxford you could feel it's a it's a strange little place those buildings <laughs> yeah uh, i lived at i lived at balliol college uh that's where i was living and my room was right above another room where queen elizabeth the first had tea like the first queen elizabeth the first had tea in the room right below where i was sleeping um below from where, where i was sleeping and i kept having a guard pop up by the window in my room and I would always see him around uh 4 a.m and I was like ah. okay yeah yeah <laughs> um and that was during my party in college days too so sometimes I was getting home around four and it kind of felt like the parent that was checking up on me like waiting for me to get home <laughs> <That's pretty funny>. <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah and I I nicknamed him Archie because that's all I that's all, really all I I didn't know anything back then. So I was like, Hey, Archie, I'm home. It's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but, so, but I went to Paris, uh, cause it was just a train right away. And one of my friends that I was with had abilities and she started to get really panicky in front of, um, the Paris opera house. And I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, I'm just really overwhelmed right now. There's so many people here. And, this was, you know, this was like February, so it was cold. <laughs> there weren't a lot of people around, but she kept saying, like, there's a lot of energy here. And, of course, Paris itself is so charged with energy. I mean, if we want to talk about paranormal stuff and hauntings in Paris, I mean, when you have all the French Revolution, well, several French Revolutions and a lot of death that happened there, especially around the Paris Opera House. Yeah. There's a lot going on. And plus, water's a water is seen as a conductor for paranormal activity. So the fact that there's water underneath the Paris Opera House. It's so, yeah. yeah. I, well, we'll have to post pictures. I'll Either I'll post pictures or you post pictures. We'll share pictures mm -hmm. of, of um, the Paris Opera House so people know what we're talking about. There, there, It was built on a lake. The lake bubbles up. And so there is water underneath, very similar to what we see in Phantom of the Opera and the play. And I guess firefighters use the water to learn how to do like underwater rescues and stuff and mm -hmm. see in the dark. So there are people that go down there, not tourists, but yep. Um, yep. first responders. So um, what are, so Palace Theater on Broadway, the, the yep. Opera House in um, Paris, what other Let's, let's start on Broadway, and then we'll get closer to home. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's interesting, and I forgot to mention this with the Palace Theater, it's actually believed to be haunted by Judy Garland. The Palace so. Theater? Mm -hmm. Oh. Judy Garland has been uh, reported at that theater, so uh, several times. Um, if the they theater... want to get on a plane and go to New York as soon as this thing is over and see whatever's right? in there. I don't even know what's yeah. going on. But whatever's playing there, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So the Richard Rogers Theater, where Hamilton is playing right now, is haunted. Um, there have been quite a few ghost stories pop up, especially from the original Broadway cast. Um, and 
I'm trying to remember exactly. Oh, so, you know, they would write lipstick messages to each other on the mirrors. Um, mm -hmm. And apparently, like, during the show or during times where people weren't in there and they would come back in and the messages would be smudged all over the mirror, like a complete mess. Um, so I always found that a little bit, I found that interesting. Um, I'm trying to think too. Oh, stall doors opening by themselves. Um, just a lot of doors. Um, there's been a howling sound at the Richard Rogers theater um, after hours. So after the show's been over and the theater's dark, the ghost lights on, there's, Surveillance has picked up a howling sound. Um, let's see, and it's not Lin Manuel Miranda brainstorming for his new ideas. Um, <laughs> I know, right? Um, there's been things falling off the shelves. Um, I believe. Oh, it is this one. Um, sightings of a redheaded woman that stood out to me because, hey, um, <laughs> you know. And if I'm gonna. If I'm gonna haunt, if I'm gonna haunt someplace after I die, it's gonna be the theater in broad, a theater in Broadway. Yeah. Um, there's been a child scene off stage, like especially with a show like Hamilton, there are no children, so and actors have reported seeing children in the wings, which, yeah, wow. <laughs> I would, you know, if I if I just kind of saw that off stage, you know, while I was performing, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> It's like, hold please. Okay, I'm gonna finish my song and okay. Um so closer to home. Mm -hmm. Um now obviously the, the, the private clients you have, we can't reveal those places, mm -hmm. but I guess what public places in our state um have had activity? Or could we say it's mm, haunted? There's or, there's a lot. Um, North Carolina has had a lot of stuff happen to it. Uh, the one that I, I go to quite often, it's called the Trivet Clinic in Hamptonville, North Carolina. It's about an hour and a half, two hours north of us. Um, Northwest. i trying to think. Yeah. And this was a clinic that had opened in the early 1920s. The owner of the clinic ended up passing away. The clinic was this only clinic really in this rural area. It's actually it's not it's not far from Statesville. Um, so if people didn't want to go to the big hospital in Statesville, they went to the clinic, the Trivet Clinic. After the owner died, the wife tried to keep the clinic up and running for like maybe another year or two, and then it closed. Then it became a supper club, a supper club um, as well as a detox clinic. So you know, go drink and then. Go get your stomach pumped afterwards. <laughs> um, you can just imagine the kind of stuff happening there. Then it became an old folks' home twice. I think it went through two or three rounds of a nursing home, and then it became a private residence. Um, and the owner and the people that lived there as residents had a lot of paranormal activity. And um, yeah, actually, that's one of my people in there. Trivia Clinic is amazing. <laughs> It is amazing. It is an incredible place. Um, and the, the ghosts there are very positive. Um, I did teach one of them how to cuss, though, uh, because they thought I was a prude. Um, <laughs> I did it hooked on phonics style. <laughs> so, um, what, yes. What, what um, time period are these ghosts from? Because you talked um, earlier about the time periods and speaking, mm -hmm. and communicating, and language they all understand, not, mm -hmm. you know. So, I think we have a lot from probably the 50s and 60s, just from the research I did about it. Um, I do know the doctor and his wife are still there, the doctor that started the Trivet Clinic. So, And she passed in the 80s, I believe. And she actually passed in Raleigh. She was in a, um, a nursing home in Raleigh. Uh, which was a weird connection. I had no clue that was there until I did some research on her. Um, so I, so we kind of just assume we're working with anywhere between like the 1930s to the 1960s, um, because I know the it became a private residence around the 70s. So I'm thinking like probably around that time frame. Um, and then it sat dormant for decades until uh, a descendant of the doctor's family ended up buying the property. So. Um, so we try to keep, uh, we try to keep around that time period. Um, the doctor's wife actually used to sing opera and 
the way we get her to talk is we play opera for her and she actually ends up coming. She, she actually talks to us and our devices go nuts. And, um, she's, she's a big fan of Puccini. We actually ended up playing La Boheme for her the very first time we were trying to communicate with her. And, uh, I was like, we actually played Musetta's Waltz. And of course I was thinking of Rent the entire time. <laughs> and I'm like, well, <laughs> and I'm like, well, That's this is too bad. Wait till you. I was like, oh, if you like Lava Wem, wait till you hear um, the re like the revised version of Lava Wem that came out like in the nineties. <laughs> oh my gosh! So. so, so when you go to a place like the Trivet Clinic and you're going there multiple times, do you? You know, I don't even know how to ask this question, but is there more activity when you get there? the second or third time or fourth time or the ghost more receptive to you being there? I would say so, actually. Um, I find that the more comfortable they are with us, the, the more they want to talk. Um, there was another theater that I invest, there was a theater I actually investigated quite aggressively when I was in San Diego and actually wrote a book about it, the 10th Avenue Theater. I had unlimited access to this building for two years. So I was there almost every other week for a while. And I found the more I was there, the more they wanted to talk because they got to know me. And I feel that's the same way with my team. Even if I bring like special guests with me, because that, that'll be the place I, I'll take people if they say, I want to try ghost hunting, but I don't know if I want to really do it. I just want to try it. So like, Lauren, if you want to go ghost hunting with me, I'll probably take you to the Trivet Clinic. We're going on a um, field trip. <laughs> going on a field trip, heading up to Hamptonville. Um that's actually the place I'll take people because I feel like I have enough of a rapport with the ghosts now. They know me, I know them. And, you know, they, 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 they communicate with us. And especially if we dress up, there was one time we dressed up as nurses uh, and we had like the appropriate wear from, I think we went 1960s with, or 1940s, 1950s with our nurses wear. And we actually did simulated um, performances, performances, I call them scenarios, where we were knocking on the doors saying, hey, does anyone need help? Does anyone need anything? Or do you need a towel? Or do you need medicine? And things were going nuts. So um, I think it awakened a different part of the Trivet Clinic that we hadn't experienced before. So that's the benefit of going multiple times. You can try out different things. Now, I feel like we need to do a disclaimer because when you say like you had access to the theater in San Francisco or San Diego for two years, you're not breaking into buildings and we are oh. not condoning that people um, break into buildings or do anything um, unauthorized. So I feel like Correct. we need to say a disclaimer. Always get permission. <laughs> Always get permission. Because um, breaking in is not good. <laughs> And I feel like, you know, we should be good. saying, like, do not try this at home. Like, do not. <laughs> yeah, I would say no. <laughs> yeah. um, so Natasha's asking, and I'll open it to questions, and both Alex and I can see your comments. So Natasha's asking, have you visited any slave quarters or plantations? Not as an investigator. Uh, I have as a person who is interested in history. Um, I want to i want to because i feel like there are important stories that we need that need to be told and i think there are important people we should meet i i'm not i don't think i'm the right person to do it without having um somebody from the community to be there with me um because otherwise i feel like it's it's be it would be me taking advantage of of a situation um I have Natasha, had experiences. Natasha's really into history, especially African American mm -hmm. history. So I'm volunteering her for that job. Okay, Natasha. <laughs> <laughs> actually, and, this is a, and actually, Natasha, if you're seriously interested in, in collaborating on something like this, I'm totally um, game because it's it, this is something that I've been wanting to look more into. Um, yeah, and plus, also, I think if we look contextually, if we did try this and it, it was just me. I don't think there would be much of a response. So um, I feel like we. I need to have the right people with me to do it. Um, I've had had experiences. Natasha's ready to go. <laughs> okay, girl, I'm gonna Facebook message you after this. Um, not necessarily happening to me, but it was actually 
I guess I could talk about it. It was it was during a I'm not going to say where just out of respect for the location because they're not really excited about the paranormal side of it. I'm still working on them. <laughs> there was a there was a performance um, that was done at at uh, uh, at the location of where they were former slave quarters. The buildings are still up. And they were performing pieces from the um, the WPA project. Uh, they had actors, um, African American actors, dressed up and saying, telling these stories. And um, I was helping out with the show. And some of you who have been here for a while may know which one I'm talking about. Um, and I was getting comments from the audience saying, you know, oh, like we had singing, but you would hear extra voices singing with the actors. Mm -hmm. um, and someone had mentioned, like, oh, adding those child actors and putting them up in the rafters of the houses was a really nice touch. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay. Wow. So, um, yeah, so that's, that is definitely something um, I think with the right people, it needs, it, it, I want to do it, um, especially for me as someone who is interested in this and, um, I feel like I have the tools. I just need the right people to do it with. So, yeah. uh, so I guess I'll throw this out there. If there's people like Natasha um, and like me um, who would be interested, how do we, con I mean, I, I guess would people message you or contact you through mm -hmm. Facebook and say we're in? Yeah, Facebook. Facebook. Um, Facebook's your best bet because I'm always on Facebook. Um, you can also email me um, at Alex matsuo at gmail.com um or facebook that's probably the best way to get a hold of me <laughs> so. and i i feel like we're going to run out of time but if we do oh, gosh, run yeah. out of time because after an hour um instagram's going to kick us off of our live chat but um thematically the paranormal has been part of our classic literature part of our theater literature for a long time and you had a lot um You've done research on the Shakespeare um, undercurrent of the paranormal. So do you want to talk about the paranormal in, in Shakespeare? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> this is a big interest of mine in grad school, uh, much to my professors. Uh, I, I feel like they might have gotten a little annoyed with it at some point because um, <laughs> I was looking for any... I, I found a lot of paranormal stuff in Shakespeare. I mean, of course, you got the fairies with Midsummer Night's Dream, the Tempest, you got magic and, you know, creature, mystical creatures and earth and water spirits. Um, but interestingly enough, with I think what really draw, drew me into Shakespeare and the paranormal at first was the Scottish play, um, with the Scottish play curse and why it exists. And... Um, I actually did quite an extensive study about it. Um, I think one, it's there's 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 rumors and legend that Shakespeare actually used actual curses and incantations to write the witch's dialogue. Um, so when that's uttered, it kind of evokes this curse. Um, but 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 before you get into it, what is what is that for people for non theater people? Because there are some non theater people on here. So what is yeah. That. So, like, the fair is foul, foul is fair, those, um, you know, those words. Um, but the Scottish plays curse, you know, my experience with it has always been whatever can go wrong, goes wrong. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, literally, I've had the weirdest things happen when I've worked on the Scottish play. Um, may, all off stage, by the way. Um, I haven't done the Scottish play as a performer yet. Um but like lights blowing up, like just in, up, like up, uh, up, uh, up there, and they just go, poof, you know, um, things blowing out. Um, swords like coming out of their scabbards, like you know, <laughs> and hitting people in the face. Um, illnesses, yeah, whatever can go wrong goes wrong, and like the weirdest and zaniest ways, um, and I think it does a combination between the dialogue in, in the play. But I also think because there's such a um, connection between, oh, you're going to do the Scottish play, you're going to get cursed. The human mind's a very powerful thing. I think it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy type of thing where we assume it's there so much and we anticipate it and we expect it and we just kind of create it ourselves. 
-hmm. So, um, yeah. And of course, uh, Shakespeare was very inspired by King James uh, with his uh, book, his ridiculous book, uh, Daemonology, um, <laughs> which was, I've read, I have it. I own it because I was like, it was on sale at Barnes and Noble. I'm like, I have to have this just because it's between being a paranormal person, a theater person, it, it, it had to be in my library. Um, <laughs> but during that time, there was an extensive exploration in the metaphysical and the supernatural. Um, I think Shakespeare was a big part of that with his plays. Um, Mar uh, Christopher Marlowe, uh, same thing. Um, even Ben Johnson, like, the de uh, what's, what's, the, what's the play he wrote? The Devil is an Asshole? Sorry, didn't mean to cuss. <laughs> It's okay. Um, yeah, I think that's actually what it's called. It's um, <laughs> devil is, <laughs> it's, or the devil is an ass. I think that's what it's called. Okay. Um, any of my Eng any of my English uh, English lip people, let me know. Um, <laughs> but I I mean, but look at Doctor Faustus. I mean, that's a that was a big that's a big supernatural play too. So I think with Shakespeare, it, he his his writings were a reflection of that time. So, um, and the witch trials were very much still a big thing happening too. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, I mean, there's, there were, I think I want to say the, one of the last witch related executions happened in the sixties, 1960s, not just, not 1760s or 1860s. So, um, and there's some people who have a theory that maybe Shakespeare had some divine inspiration um, with his plays, especially when he was writing about things that he had not seen in his lifetime and said and explained them with accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, so I've actually read a few possession theories with that, um, being that Shakespeare may have been possessed by a ghost who had seen that, who had had those experiences and were telling their stories through Shakespeare. That's really like... <laughs> If you thought the Oxfordian theory was weird, I mean, I got some weirder theories for you. So, um, yeah. That's, yeah. I feel like that we're going to have to have another, another Instagram <laughs> live, like just on that, like literature and paranormal. I just, I mean, there's so much, um, to unpack because I think a lot of people like me are very interested, very fascinated, but also very afraid to ask. So I'm so glad that you're willing to talk about it. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. If I, I'm sure people may have questions. So if you do type them in the comments and we can see them and read them. Um, you've written several books on the subject. So talk mm -hmm. about the books talk about where people can find the books i know you were supposed yeah. to do a book signing that was canceled which really stayed. i know but um it does but it'll but be yeah. rescheduled hopefully yeah. soon <laughs> um yeah so i think for this audience uh i've written several books but i think the one that i think everyone in this group would really appreciate would be um the haunted actor and haunted that's actor. literally the haunted actor yeah that's okay. kind of almost my dissertation from grad school because I did this whole study about um, the supernatural in theater and I did it from a religious standpoint, not as a, I like ghosts perspective. <laughs> um, because I think a lot of, uh, of our belief system, you know, I mean, the ancient Greeks were ghost hunting. I mean, it wasn't called ghost hunting back then, but I mean, even from the before, even before the ancient Greeks, I mean, people have been looking for ghosts and a lot of that belief in ghosts actually, I, to me, for me, inspired performance as we know it today. Um, especially when you talk about oral tradition, when you look at that, um, and that belief in that spiritual belief and whatnot and how it evolved and changed over time. Um, so I go into a lot of that history. Um, I also talk about uh, why witches were such a pivotal plot point in um, English literature and performance. Um, I talk a lot about that. I talk about the supernatural elements in Shakespeare in really great detail. Actually, the book is a little academic. Um, I want to I want to say it was in University of Indiana or Indiana State. They actually use my book as part of their curriculum now. Uh, when they're looking into the spiritual world of theater. Yeah. Um, so I get a nice royalty check from that every year. 
<laughs> every semester. Cool. That is really yeah, it's, cool. it's, yeah. Um, it gets it gets quoted a lot in a lot of people in a lot of um, different things where people are trying to explore like the theater and supernatural and whatnot. So can um, people get the book on Amazon or on your website? Yeah. Or? It's on Amazon. Um, you can get it on Amazon. I also have copies, like physical copies with me um, on hand if people are interested. I have a couple of hardcover copies as well. Um, so that's, and I also go into, um, especially with a very alarming trend of supernatural occurrences that happen um, in Hamlet's between, in the scene between Hamlet and the ghost of Hamlet's father. Um, mm. I know there was a trivia question based on that. Um, and it wasn't just one actor that had that experience of seeing their father as the ghost of Hamlet's father. It's happened to a, an alarming number of actors playing Hamlet. Like, uh, and it's an alarming rate. Um, to the point where I'm like, what's happening here? Why? Why does this happen? Is it intense method acting? Are there other characters in Shakespeare where people have taken on those roles and seen that, or is it just characteristically that play? I've heard I've heard a little bit with um, the Scottish play with Banquo, um, with Banquo's ghost, um, and usually the ghost that's seen there is somebody will see a person that they may have not have treated nicely or may have betrayed a bit. I mean, Freud would have a field day with this. Um, <laughs> Uh, so that's something I've noticed too, but again, that's the Scottish play. There's a lot of weird things happening with the Scottish play, but I don't know what it is about that scene with Hamlet and the ghost of Hamlet's father, um, because Ham if you don't hear Hamlet like conjuring anything up, like right before that scene happens, so, um, and I've noticed it's only happened to uh, actors whose father has, has passed. Um, like, they'll instead of seeing the actor's face, who's playing the ghost, it's their father's face. And I find it interesting, too, like, Shakespeare doesn't call the ghosts by their name. It's always the ghost of Hamlet's father. Mm -hmm. um, it's not Hamlet's father. It's the ghost of Hamlet's father. So it's like, so there's a weird identity thing going on in there, too, with the character naming. So. Okay, we're going to get to Bonnie's question in a minute. I'm going to say what the trivia question is so we can have more entries. Alex has been very generous. She's giving away a copy of one of her books to one of you guys. Um, and here's the trivia question. So before we get into the answer, it's which Hollywood actor saw the ghost of his father while playing the title role in Hamlet? And you can type your answer in the comments. We're going to spin this virtual wheel that's on my computer, and I'll try to hold up my computer <laughs> so you can all see the virtual wheel spinning, and you can do that. <laughs> Put it, your answer in the comments while Alex answers Bonnie's question. Um, yeah. Can you see her question about... Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So there's a few ways, there's a few things you can do. Um, I mean, there's... There's, I mean, there is Sage, but besides Sage, um, I would probably recommend, uh, there's prayer and meditation, and when I say prayer, it doesn't have to be necessarily a Christian prayer. It can be something that empowers you and makes you feel like you're in control, um, and uh, a big part of it is probably doing some daily, daily meditation, especially right now with everything going on and people being cooped up. Um, I am getting an influx of messages in my inbox about how to deal with negative energy in a house. Um, and which makes sense because we're all stuck at home right now. Um, I like to visualize a white light or something like Glinda's bubble from Wizard of Oz and just kind of pushing out all like the negative energy, like just kind of visualize it. Um, I mean, some people believe in, like, having stones and crystals, like, that can um, absorb energy, especially, like, uh, black tourmaline, um, hematite, uh, stones like that can really help, because um, that takes up the negative energy and kind of puts it in the ground. Um, yeah, there's a few things you can do, um, but that's that's the super abridged version of that, of that answer. Okay, cool. All right, so nobody is piping in with an answer to this question. So the answer to that question was 
Daniel Day Lewis, and yeah. we're going to spin this wheel. Um, Bonnie, Melissa, and Judy posted their answers on my social media posts last night. So they're the ones entered in this drawing. Um, and and um, tell me the story around this Daniel Day Lewis thing. Yep. <laughs> So, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis was starring in Hamlet on the West End. Um, I'm pulling up my notes on this. I want to make sure I tell the story right, because it's, uh, <laughs> it's a pretty, um, pretty intense. Uh, so, this was back in um, 1989. 1989, so it was in the West End. And um, some people say he left in the middle of the performance, which... Honestly, if if that happened to me, I'd probably leave in the middle of a performance, too. <laughs> um, I'll be honest. And what's interesting is he tried to take back the story, like, back in, like, I want to say early 2010s. He was trying to say, like, oh, that actually didn't happen. But, I mean, the, the legend, the, the story was alive and well since 1989. So, um, but, yeah, he was performing. Um, he was performing in Hamlet and the infamous uh, Ghost of Hamlet's Father scene came up and um and he saw supposedly he saw the the face of his father but we also all know that daniel day lewis is an intense method actor mm -hmm. so um I, I actually had to pull up the quote because the way he kind of skirts around it amuses me he says to some extent i probably saw my father's ghost every night because of course you're working in a play like hamlet you explore everything through your own experience um <laughs> so it was like mm, you let this you let this exist for decades yeah <laughs> <laughs> you let this ex you let this exist for decades so i'm not sure but that was one of his last the theater performances some some say it was like i think it was his very last one but i think he's had a few more since then but yeah daniel day lewis was the one who really that was the first um that was the first like Oh, that's interesting. And I'm like, did anyone else experience this? And then I did some research and I found out, oh, there's more stories about this. And that's so cool. I mean, well, I, I feel one, like one could even, oh, go ahead. No, I feel like we're going to, uh oh, I lost my wheel. Um, I feel like we're going to have to do another Facebook. Um, oh, I have a whole thing about how live. I think actors are psychic too. Yeah, <laughs> I have Facebook a whole thing. Live, and I totally lost my wheel here. Um, so I may have to do the drawing afterwards because I like to do these randomly, but I will do the spinning wheel with Melissa and Judy and, um, whoever the other person was, I have it on my social media post. And then here's my daughter joining us. Um, Hi. and then mm -hmm. we will do the, um, we'll, I'll do the drawing and I'll post it. And thank you so much. This was so cool. So the longer we're in quarantine, you and I have to do this again because there's so much to unpack here. I mean, there's this is a oh, big yeah. topic. We're gonna have to oh, do it's like a Zoom huge. meeting so we can go longer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't. Care oh yeah, talk. I'm up so, for that. <laughs> thank you, Alex, for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, now <laughs> head over to sing for interact hashtag sing mm -hmm. for interact on facebook so you can hear the live concert at eight o'clock and um thank you everyone thank you alex thank you for all your support yeah. too that's what i was saying to people before you popped on is that you've been so supportive and wonderful to me and um i just i appreciate you so much so thank you for that well, i appreciate you too and everything that you do for the theater oh. community it means a lot well, thank so. you, and um, I will see you all back here tomorrow. Tomorrow is a little earlier. I'm chatting with the director of the North Carolina Theater Production of Memphis, Robert Hartwell, at 4 mm. p.m., so come right back here to the RDU on Stage Instagram um, live page, and I will see you then. Thanks, Alex. Take care. Everyone stay Thanks. safe and healthy. <laughs> yep. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching.